In college, I made sure to participate in as many Indian organizations as I could to maintain my exposure and my appreciation for Indian culture. Um, throughout my life, I have um, experienced instances of racism, but you just learn to not let the ignorance of others keep you from keep you from progressing. Um, I started my job. Namaskar, welcome to the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol Banega Sost India at Bank of Baroda Mughal Tent. We are delighted to introduce Hunch Prose, Searching the Labyrinth. The session is presented by Hawthornden Literary Retreat. Two distinguished literary figures speak of their prose, poetry, and the spaces in between. Ranjit Hoskote is an influential Indian poet, art critic, cultural theorist, and independent curator whose dazzling new book of verse, Hunch Prose, engages reflectively with diverse and disparate realities. It is dedicated in its entirety to his longtime friend, Ruth Parel, while individual poems may pay tribute to other inspirations. Padel is a poet, novelist, and an important voice in contemporary literature. Her recent novel, Daughters of the Labyrinth, set in present times, follows an artist from London who returns to her family from Crete following a bereavement. In an intense, multi-layered narrative of displacement, identity, and history, she confronts buried family secrets, proud memories, and dark pasts. In a session of reading and conversation, the two writers talk of their understanding of each other's work and their ways of seeing, understanding, recording, and standing witness. So welcome, Ranjit, and welcome. Ruth is an award-winning British poet, professor of poetry at King's College London, fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, author of 12 literary of poetry corrections, two books on wildlife and two novels. Her latest novel is set on the Greek island of Crete, where she has lived on and off since she was 20. Ranjit is a poet, critic, cultural theorist, and independent curator who is the recipient of Sahitya Academy Award, the Sahitya Academy Golden Jubilee Award, and the Sahitya Academy Prize for translation. His collections of poetry include Vanishing Acts, Central Time, Jonah Whale, and Hunch Prose. His translation of a celebrated 14th century Kashmiri woman mystics poetry has appeared as I Lala, the poems of Lal dead. In fact, on this very forum, just yesterday, he was awarded the Mahakavi Kanhaya Lal Setia Poetry Award. Welcome again, Ranjit and Poetry. Ruth, it's marvelous to be back in conversation with you. And I have to uh, warn this very generous audience that since we don't have a moderator, this is likely to be a somewhat immoderate exchange. <laughs> but uh, Ruth, I thought it would be wonderful if uh, we could begin with a kind of a prelude or an overture. And uh, could I invite you to read a passage from your novel, Lovely. Daughters of the Labyrinth? Thank you. So um, one of the many things that Ranjit and I have in common, I think imaginatively, is that we respond to um, visual cues to artifacts and to history. And so my, in my um, narrator, she's called Ri, which is short for Ariadne. She comes from Crete, but she hasn't lived there for a long time. And she's now back in the city of Hanya, which is a city that does have some Minoan ruins, but it doesn't have the sort of palace um, of, of which Knossos has. 
And um, I think the, the Minoan civilization is roughly contemporaneous with the Harappan civilization of the Indus Valley. So um, that's, it's going back a long way. And she has just discovered something absolutely shattering about her mother, who is 97, and she thought she was an Orthodox Christian, and she's just discovered that she, her mother was Jewish, never told them, and has lived through the Holocaust on Crete, which she never knew happened. So there is a lot of hiddenness and hurt and discovery going on in her about her relation to her mother. Normally, oh, well, also she's an artist and there is um, a woman from Mumbai who was at art school with her in the 70s in London, has just, she's just reconnected with her and she's invited her to come and spend some time painting in Mumbai, she's a painter. So she's very excited about that. Um, I wander numbly for a while. Everyone is getting ready for the tourist season. They are whitewashing their houses and setting out window displays. Thinking of Mumbai and gateways to India, I buy a few small canvases, stretched and primed in the art supply shop. Normally, I love walking through the old town. The shades of stone, butterscotch, ginger, saffron, the complicated arches, the courtyards, the balconies, always something unexpected. Today, I keep noticing how we need protection. The church of San Rocco, always protected the town from plague. The mosque used to contain a sword of healing. I look up the barrel of its minaret, gold against a cornflower sky. They all met here in Khanya, churches, mosques, and synagogues, Muslims, Christians, Jews. The architecture at least is harmonious. I picture the German bombers, which Papa saw, and smoke spiraling up from this town. How did anything survive? Lots of houses didn't. There are roofless houses here too, mustard colored walls, now smothered in deep blue flowers. Now I'm in the street of knives. On one side, there are shops with black handled knives that sum up Cretan pride, well, male pride. On the other, Oak stone wall, a wall of all our history, Greek and Roman, Byzantine, Venetian and Ottoman masonry on top of each other like a golden sandwich. Crete has so many layers, you walk from one epoch to another in a, in a second. And here are the earliest ruins of all in an excavation railed off from the road. The only Minoan ruins we have in Khanya are domestic streets. A whole unexplored palace may lurk under the modern town, but no one will let you get at it. The roof and fence fling shadows over the gold cobbles. These little streets are Hanya's oldest memory, a flash of the unconscious, the labyrinth beneath us all. I tighten my fingers around the railings and think how light still shines upon us from stars that no longer exist. Now, can I, I would like to invite Ranjit to read a poem from his wonderful collection. Thank you so much. Ruth, it was a remarkable passage. And because I have a talent for digressions, uh, it just reminded me of a passage in, in one of Joseph Roth's novels. I can't remember if it's the, the, the Rodetsky March or uh, the Emperor's Tomb. But the protagonist has this dream of the Ottoman Empire, of the, of the Habsburg Empire, and it's measured out in terms of uh, precisely this architecture, music. He thinks of churches, of mosques, of uh, the mass, the, the, the azan. And it just strikes me that cultural confluence has really been the rule uh, wherever you look in the world, and yet, there have been cycles of violence which try to erase this multiplicity and plurality. So I'm going to respond to that passage with this poem, uh, which is the last poem in Hunch Prose. It's called Letters from Ogaret and um, is set in a Bronze Age city not far from Crete, 
It's, uh, Ras, it's called Ras Shamra today. It's on the North Syrian coast. So it's a poem about how, well, this is the poem, Never mind what it's about. Letters from Ogarip. Fire saved these words, cut into clay, corded sounds of desert and surf, gouged into flesh. Father, look, the enemy's ships, the sea people, my cities torched. These words saved no one, not sender, not receiver. My country burning, my chariots lost. Words that did not carry across the numb sand. Your messenger saw our threshing floors charred, our vineyards ripped up from their roots. Messenger, we could have been howling on the moon's far side with his barbed whip. Marduk cut down my guardian angel. He broke my shield, he drove me from my house. No one heard, no one cried when they heard. These baked sounds other hands would draw and fit into tamer molds. Alpu, Betu, Gamu, ox, house, camel, recording barrels and bales. Marduk pull me from the river. Listing sails and hulls, Marduk let this cloud pass. Sounds that have rung through every changing, trembling shape. Even when the reed breaks, the ink fades, and there is no moon, save these words. Stunning. <clears throat> so I want, uh, you know, when I, when I, was reading this was I wish I've read so many times again this morning and I, I, I apologize for using this I've lost my notes so it oh they're all on here so you have these two lines in an earlier poem what can I offer you except fraying knots coiled riddles scrolled bones keys to doors that were carted away by raiders lost doors I could have opened with my breath so Ranjit, your, your, your book is called Hunch Prose, and the hunch is really important. There's the hunch of the hunchback of Notre Dame, who is this misshapen self that nevertheless releases this wonderful music of bells all over Paris. There's the hunch of intuition, where you have a hunch you go by feeling, not by thought. And then maybe also there's hunching over because you're hunching over afraid of something or going to be attacked by something. So all these things. So there's, there's so much accumulated erudition and knowledge and scholarship behind the work. And maybe that's something we also have in common. How do you negotiate the relationship between knowing things and erudition and feeling? Because nobody, you know, Keats said about, about um, about poetry that tries to tell you something. Nobody wants to, nobody, you know, but nobody wants to listen to a man who keeps trying to put his hand in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so you do not try, your poems don't try and put their hands in our pockets. But how do you how do you manage to get that get that fusion of erudition and feeling? Ruth, this is a problem I think that we both share, which is um, how in fact to keep that knowledge at bay in some ways. And to me, it takes different forms. I think it's important for me to follow the sound, to follow the musicality of where that's leading. And also to see if the body of the poem can be a kind of um, theater, if you will. Like the poem that I just read, Letters from Ogre, it actually also includes voices that have been silent for thousands of years and are available to us only through um, through letters that we can barely decipher on, on these clay tablets, which were baked in the fire that destroyed the city. So to me, this is like a primal scene for what we do as, as poets. We are trying to decipher signals. We are trying to look for, uh, for forms of knowledge that come to us through sensation and intuition more viscerally. Yeah. Would you like to say anything about the hunch of hunch prose? all of those things actually uh the fact that as poets we 
we speak from a position of vulnerability yet make a claim to the public sphere. There's also a memory of a time when as poets, we did have a claim on the public sphere. And now are we marginal? Can we yet intervene in urgencies? What are the forms of language that we, we have to cultivate for this? And actually that leads me to the question that I had for you, which is on similar lines, you've, your experience of Crete has been, as it, it's a lifelong commitment. And uh, when you first went there, for instance, uh, you went there as someone who was uh, academically trained in classical Greek and your research work and your early books had to do with ancient Greece and its poetics and its politics. And in Crete, you arrived in the midst of possibly a country that was still recovering from the ravages of World War II and uh, the civil war at some remove. And uh, also things that perhaps people didn't talk about for a long time, the, the forced exchange of populations between Turkey and Greece. So could you tell us about what that experience was? Uh, placing yourself in this context, becoming part of it in some way and sharing in these secret histories? Thank you. That, that's an extraordinary question and I haven't really ever been asked that. Um, so when I went to Crete, it was 1970, I think, 1969, 1970. I was a student. I was doing, I was studying ancient Greek tragedy at Oxford and um, the archaeologists thought I ought to, I ought to be studying something you could hold in your hands. So they sent me off to the trenches and there I met the Cretan workmen. And from their stories, I, I heard, um, had stories about, you know, the, the war and about the German occupation and so on. Um, it was poor, they were poor. Um, and yet they, are, they were so rich in words. And so I learned Greek, to speak modern Greek with a Cretan accent, a very heavy Cretan accent, which shocked my Athenian friends. Um, and, um, but I also learned their songs um, and, and there was the language, above all there was the language. So, I mean, at one point I asked a friend of mine, a young workman who was, he was shy because he knew much better what to do than an older man who was messing it all up. And I said, why don't you, why don't you ask him? Are you, I said, for Varsay, are you afraid? And he said, no, civil me, I, I respect, I feel awe. And that is one of the first um, things, the earliest Greek tragedy we have, the Persians, the, the elders say that very word, sevomai, sevome, when they see the ghost of their dead emperor rising up. And I thought, my God, I am in touch with Aeschylus. <laughs> I mean, I also felt other things, but that's one of the things I felt. So that was, it was incredibly shaping for me. And so, you know, things that happened to that person, for instance, his, his father was killed by the Germans in a way that my hero's grandfather was killed because he refused to give up his guns. Um, and yeah, it was, it was my experience of, of life in a, in a, a post-danger, just post-danger society. It was also, it's an island with its own laws of clan and tribe, which seems almost as if we were speaking of it from a kind of ethnographic lens. But one of the books that I reread uh, during the lockdown was a set of essay, late essays by Nikos Kazantzakis, who I frankly I don't even, I actually asked this question in, on social media, does anybody uh, you know, below 50 even remember who he was? But he was so popular at one point. And he evokes this creed of, uh, you know, uh, having a memory of the Ottoman period, of even a Sufi dervish order, which is still on the island. So it seems as though certain aspects of collective memory were present. Absolutely. And of course, it's um, in, and in the language as well, because a lot, of, a lot of words you use for words you use every day, like bread, is a, is a Turkish word, not a Greek word. Um, you know, I don't hope there are no Greeks here to be offended by this. And when I, and originally, you know, the coffee that we all were drinking, we would call it a, Turk, a Turkish. You'd say, I'll have a Turkish, please, a black Turkish or a Turkish with sugar. Now it's called Greek. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it's um, a very complicated thing. And I, going back to the novel, um, these two girls, they um, at London Art School, 
the Cretan one sees the sees the English as quite benign. They helped discover the archaeology, which has helped tourism. They helped in the resistance against the Germans. The empire that colonized them for 500 years was the Ottoman Empire. But for the Indian girl, of course, it was the British Empire. And, and the Cretan girl is very shocked when she hears stories of the partition that she'd never heard of in Crete. So, so it's, I thought that was so interesting to put these girls side by side and different views of London and what being in London meant, meant to them was an important thing. But even in terms of the Cretan um, history of that period, I was, I think I was a bit shocked as I read your book and I was totally immersed in it to think that my own sense of that period came out of a very male tradition of writing. So for me, it's, uh, don't kill me, Ruth, it's Patrick Leifermer. And, uh, you know, you, you see the British involvement on the island out of a very heroic kind of sense of, you know, almost a James Bond kind of sense of scholars turned warriors and secret agents. But I know you have a different story about this. Yes, and that, that's one of the things I was writing quite consciously against, of course, because, yes, a lot of male Cretans are very proud of the kidnap of the General Kripo and so on. But, you know, there were, there were women and children living in the cities as well as in the villages and the mountains. So what happened when the Germans occupied it, they, they occupied the cities, of course, and then they sent you know, platoons through the mountains, but they're very, very big mountains and it's full of Cretan clans. And so very quickly, within a couple of days across Crete, um, these, these resistance things were forming. The British, they had Palestine, they had Alexandria um, and, and Cairo, and they wanted to tie up as many German troops in Crete as possible because there were other fronts. There was the Russian front and there was North Africa. So the more problems they could create for the Germans on this island, the better from the point of view of the, of the, British, of the British high command. Um, and so that's what happened. And the Germans knew that there were British officers doing that. So they absolutely drenched the island in, in soldiers, which was actually very bad for the Cretans, the Cretan villages, the Cretan women. Um, and one of the characters in the book who is a Brit, a Brit um, feels very guilty. They said, if we hadn't been here, not nearly so many Cretans would have died. Um, and so, but I also wanted the experience of children and women and so on in the book. I want to ask you a question now. <laughs> um, this is a, it, it's a wonderful book with lots of experimental forms, but it's introduced by a prose poem. And um, this, this figure of the prose poem um, is, um, he, the, the, the speaker of it says, I called myself Bombay. And so there's so much multiplicity in it, but it begins with a speaker who calls himself Bombay. So I wondered, does this plurality sort of ripple out from your wonderful plural city? You know, Bombay has always been a city where there's a kind of impulse towards plurality, diversity, simply because it's been nourished by so many diverse populations. It, there is a kind of a native cosmopolitanism. But equally, there's a tension between this and a nativist sensibility. There's a pulling back to what ideas of what is truly innate and native to the place. But in the prose poem, which opens Hunch Prose, the speaker comes to us from a history that's really not acknowledged about Bombay, which is its history as a slave port. So it's Siddhi Mubarak Bombay. That's the speaker of the poem. And... Uh, he was brought across as a child, an enslaved child to Bombay in the, in the early 19th century. And he spent much of his life there before his master uh, freed him. And he went back to Zanzibar and then launched himself on a different and highly public career as a guide to some of the great Victorian explorations of, of Africa. Uh, Stanley, Speak, Burton, so to me, the poem was a way of acknowledging this invisible history. So it's part of Bombay's plurality, but it's, it's unknown to most people. And there's a politics of naming that happens in the course of that poem. Uh, at various points, he 
stops to think about and tell us what he's called. So he's called a Siddhi because he's from the Zanj, from uh, the coast of East Africa. His master, who seems to have a cruel sense of humor, is called him Mubarak, which is the blessed. But he calls himself Bombay. So there's, a, there's that sense of how someone, even in a vulnerable and subaltern position, could have agency, could have choice, could choose to name themselves and to be part of some larger solidarity. So I think these are, these are crucial questions uh, for me, both in poetry and in terms of what you might call a larger sense of what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be uh, part of a larger polyphony and to try and include and amplify as many voices as possible, particularly those that are marginal, that are left out of the record, that are eclipsed or repressed. Well, why, why did he get a prose poem? <laughs> At least partly because I, I, it's one of the many challenges that the lyric poem faces. This is a question that you've often enough recurred to and that you've opened out. So I wanted to break up the idea of a short lyric poem that expresses a singular subjectivity and its, and its questions and problems. So how does, how does this poem open up more? How do I get different kinds of voices into this poem? So among, among the things that I do in that poem is also to distort the English of, of the poem, what I'm gonna provisionally call the Angrezi of that poem with linguistic interferences. So there are some phrases and sentences that are modeled on Gujarati or Hindi Hindustani, the languages that Siddhi Mubarak Bombay would have spoken. So again, it felt like a stage for those kinds of linguistic experiments. It's, but it's, it's wonderful. Um, so, but another aspect of it is the climate crisis. The climate crisis and, and the environmental crisis more deeply informs everything in the book. And um, there's one absolutely heartrending journey, the, the longest journey um, by a little Arctic fox, a little female who goes, who travels 3,506 kilometers on ice from Norway to Canada. And then we get sort of the mythical golden deer um, moving from one burning forest to the next. So how do we, I mean, there will be lots of poets in the audience. How do we write poems that are up to this apocalypse that we're facing, which we have caused? And I mean, we can't write about this all the time. We've got to set it in our own time. What do we do? The myths don't vanish. I mean, that's also the lesson that I take away from your book, Daughters of the Labyrinth. Uh, archetypal patterns, uh, ways in which we've tried to account for our experience, these remain with us. The question is when the subject matter, so to speak, of it and our relationship with it is breaking down, uh, how do we retrieve this? How do we retrieve this question came up the other day also in a discussion of Shadeep Sen's book that we did. Uh, how do you take the formal cycle of the seasons and make it relevant to a time when everything is so incredibly unseasonal? How do we celebrate the heroism of the survivor? And how do we try and do this across species? I think there's a tremendous sense that we all have today that this idea of humankind as a sovereign species is completely untenable and that we have to reach out to the experiences also of other species. So to me, when I read this, I mean, starting point was a news report, uh, the forest fires, the Arctic fox. And you think about these, these incredible adventures that members of other species are undertaking, but in a time of near extinction, which contours this in a certain way. And so I think when we bear witness to this, we're drawing on mythic resources, but we're crafting new myths for the times. Yes. I mean, what I notice, I mean, I teach um, undergraduates in, in London and their poems, there are still, everybody has to work out if you're 20, if you're 19, 20, 21, or the age I am, everybody wants to work out their own identity. So they are writing poems about their own identity. Um, and so our sense of identity is sort of infused with what's happening to other species, whether they're elephants or golden foxes. But speaking of myth and its relevance or how we transmute it in some ways, uh, at some point in the middle of reading your novel, it came to me that in a sense, the deep 
metaphor of the book was Pandora's box or Pandora's jar in the original. And it's as if Reed, the protagonist, was had somehow managed to open this box or jar and all kinds of discontents and dangers were pouring out of it. And eventually it works to hope. But was that at some point, or was there a subliminal presence in your work? Did you have it in mind at some point? Oh, well, that's fascinating. I mean, no, I was thinking really about the Minotaur, the minor, because that's why it's the labyrinth, you know, the, the Minotaur of Crete. And she gradually uncovers more and more secrets that she had no idea of. But they also help to make sense of her own identity. And finally, she just she comes upon the presence of somebody who has she'd never heard of, who has been around her all the time, and who is in her mother's life. And although it's a terrible shock to her, it also makes sense of how her mother treated her. And I and I did a, quite a lot of work about um, inherited trauma and third generation trauma. And so at some point she says, I think my mother's sense of loss must be imprinted on me, like the face in the Turin shroud. And I was thinking about you know, something that happened to a mother, the child, the daughter, in this case, can, can, can feel it too knows it in some part of herself and I was very when I first you know took the poem to the publisher and I got a publicist who was actually whose mother um came from was was came in partition she she was Indian and she came from um Calcutta and she never wanted to go back to India she would never talk about it but this girl when she when she read the book she recognized something about her experience of her mother's experience that she wouldn't talk about And that, I think, is, is the sort of labyrinth of self. I had not thought about it as Pandora's jar so much as discovering the secret of what's in your own identity, what's at the heart of your own experience of who could be more close and more important to you from your source, your origin, your mother. But there's also a trope of crossing. It's And your two key characters, uh, Ri, who is Greek and discovers she has some Jewish heritage, and Nashita, the, her Indian friend, who brings with her a completely different set of resonances, but not that far off. And in the course of that, there's an Amrita Shergill painting that assumes great importance to girls. So yes. where, where did you discover that painting? Your wife told me about it. <laughs> I walked into that, I suppose. <laughs> I, I, um, I had been very, I was, I love Amrita Shergill's work. And it was a Pakistani friend who told me to go to her, her exhibition that was about 20 years ago in the Tate. And so I had many books about hers and I studied her. Um, and in the, in, you know, in the story, my character's story, her friend Nashita tells her about her. And she is fascinated because she is Cretan living in London and she's now married a Jewish man and this is all very strange to her and Amrita was half Jewish Hungarian and half Sikh so um so she was a half and half girl like her and, and Amrita died so tragically young and to have to have invented Indian modernism as a half Jewish Hungarian girl is extraordinary and so she really gets very excited about this. And then your wife, Nancy, told me about this two girls in which one is almost blind and has no eyes. And, and it seems to express Amrita's sense of, her, of the two parts of herself. Um, and that, that painting becomes very, very important to her in the book. But also because um, <clears throat> for the source of, of, of the, the story, there are two girls a photograph, the one photograph from all the Jews who were taken by the Germans. And I won't tell you because I, if you read the novel, I don't, it, it's an extraordinary story and a heartrending story, but it's completely unique to Crete, what happened to them. But um, there were two girls who were Jewish sisters in this little town of Hanya. And Hanya is an, in a way a sort of mini Bombay. It's, it's, um, it's a little port town with a long multiple history, but the nativist has, has won out. And so, so it's just, it wants to be just Cretan um, Orthodox. 
it didn't want to have the memory of the Jews. It was a very complicated thing. And um, anyway, the man who rescued this last synagogue was sitting one night in the synagogue quietly. He had rescued it from rubble and people were coming and a woman walked in. She was Greek, but she obviously was, had lived in America a long time. And she said, oh, this is a synagogue. I wonder if you could help me. And she said, um, I grew up here in Hanya and I had two school friends. They, they were Jewish and, and I wondered if you knew where I could find them. And he, he sort of sat her down and then he told her that all the Jews had, had died. And um, then she brought out this photograph, the photograph of the only two people who had, had survived. That, uh, who, uh, the photograph had survived and the, uh, two, the only two people of those all who, who drowned. And then she wrote out for him uh, an account, an eyewitness account of the arrest by the Germans. And one of these girls had called up to her and said, will you look after my box for me? And she'd said, yes. And there they are, these two girls, they're sort of, as it were, 12 and 13, just on a balcony in 1943. And within a year, they were under the sea. Yeah, I've, yeah, it's, it's, it's a history that just breaks your heart. It's, um, when we talked about this before, it reminded me of an exhibition I went to a long, long ago when I was a teenager. It was an exhibition of drawings and paintings by the children in uh, uh, Theresienstadt, which was the, the paradise ghetto which the Nazis had presented as a, as a kind of showpiece for visiting Red Cross and uh, you know, diplomats. And just the horror of seeing these beautiful drawings and paintings and knowing that as soon as the delegations had left, the, children's were go the children were gonna be put on to transports to the death camps. Yeah. So that, that moves us on to another thing I'd like to ask you about, because you, you have this um, quite late on, you say where, in this garden of unsealed tombs, did we lose our serenades? And this sense of loss comes through so much of the poems, and yet they are celebratory. How, how do you get, I mean, I, what I felt is that your sense of delight in language, in art, in made things, and in the joy of people making things is, a, is somehow what bridges the sense of loss and the sense of celebration, is that? Could, is that area? I think that's absolutely valid. I think the only way we can deal with the, the visceral experience of mortality and extinction is by thinking of what can outlast us. It can take the form of a small ivory icon that a Stone Age artist made, or a painting today, or a song that might be forgotten but might be discovered by someone else. And I think it's that claim to to, to be vital and to remain that really has uh, inspired human survival and the human adventure. So I think both of these are incredibly present to us at this time of mass extinction. Because um, one of the things that you're doing in your sort of um, curatorial hat is you're doing a whole series of, of um, um, things online about lots and lots of different speakers talking about the environment and artists, artists and scientists and environmentalists all contributing. Would you like to say a little bit about that? Because it seems to me to infuse your work at the moment. State of Nature, which is this project that, um, uh, that Ravi Agarwal invited me to join. So we've co-curated the latest iteration of it, which takes the form of an exhibition and a conference and a set of uh, lectures and presentations, which all deal with this question of uh, how to deal with the fact of nature changing around us and us changing as a part of nature. What is the recalibrated relationship and what can we do to bear witness to this through the arts, through poetry, through what is often called eco-poetics. And it seems very, very important to bring together what otherwise remains trapped in islands of expert knowledge so that poets, artists, anthropologists, uh, scientists of various kinds can actually come together and find common languages to speak in. And that seems to be uh, uh, a compelling need at this point. Otherwise, we're 
uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of impending doom, but no corresponding sense of how we can deal with it in however modest a way. And also, I think, with the, with the young, <laughs> we're, we're looking, I mean, Greta Thunberg is a great inspiration. And, um, and I'm thinking now of young poets, young writers, what are they going to write? How have you any words for them, Ranjit? <laughs> um, how can how can they how can they be their best selves in this time? I'm actually at the strange stage when I'm. Uh, it sounds absurd, possibly to say it, but I'm trying to learn from them because the world that they've come into is is it has challenges that I no longer feel I can fully deal with. And uh, what, is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a child at a time of possible mass extinction? What is the form of consciousness that that brings into being? So I think we're launched on a, on a great arc of relearning and with some luck, we'll still be in time. But, <laughs> but this brings me to a question I had, I had for you, uh, yeah, really, uh, time. But, but we still have some time. So uh, Ruth, I'm going to ask you about the work you've done in committing yourself once again to the East Mediterranean, to the Aegean, through your, your visits to Lesbos, to what is uh, an island once associated with Sappho and today greatly associated with this porous membrane between refugees who are homeless and people who are hospitable in the first place, but are now anxious. And how that's translated both in terms of activism and uh, your collaboration with with a visual artist. Could you could you speak to us about that? Yes. So um, the big the big migrations coming from the Syrian uprisings and the war there happened in 2015 when um, they were all trying to get away. It's a very narrow crossing between Lesbos, which is right up next door to to under where Troy was and and quite near to sort of. Some, um, uh, Istanbul and so on, and the peninsula that stretches out into the sea from Turkey there. So it's a really of a, of a crossing. It could take you only 20 minutes in a sort of reasonable sea in a reasonable boat. But um, these poor people are being smuggled over by um, people who sell them um, at great cost, um, these sort of uh, life jackets, which actually don't work. I mean, it's extraordinary. There were, must have been factories filling these things with sawdust to sell to these desperate people with their children to come across. And of course, a lot die. Um, and so there was, a, there was a camp set up. It was supposed to hold 1,500 people. By the time I got there, which was a year later, there were still boats coming, um, but the camp now held 6,000 people. And today, there's something like 25,000 um, refugees on Lesbos. And at first, the Lesbot Islanders was, was, were really hospitable and um, they helped pull them out of the water. They gave, them, they gave them food, they gave them all sorts of things. But as, as things settled in over time, it became much harder. It's an island, it's an agricultural island. It, has, it sells very good olive oil, ouzo, um, and that's about it. And um, the, you know, the, the refugees were cutting down their olive trees because for, for, they were cold. They were taking their chickens because they were hungry because the Greek state just gave them sort of plastic sandwiches and things. And it was, and the whole process was, was appalling. There were lots of NGOs whom I talked to. I went into quite a lot of camps and so on. Um, but I also rang up a friend of mine, an art, Syrian artist in Cambridge, whom I'd done work with already. And I said, we must do something together, Isam. And he was already making little boats out of mudguards. Um, because he was thinking of all the crossings. So when I got back from Lesbos, I showed him my pictures of the graveyards. The Lesbos villagers had, had put little bits of marble and tried to commemorate the bodies they found. It was heartrending, little things like girl, three years, boy, 15 years. And, um, you know, they had also put a toy, there was a toy caterpillar that they put over a child's grave, for instance. I mean, it was, it was just amazing. Um, so I wrote a poem and Isam did his boats. And then we took this installation around a while. We took it to Venice, Biennale. We took it to America and so on. Um, but it was, I, I did feel that it, it doesn't help the islanders. I mean, it brings the plight 
to other people. That's true. And we did, eventually we took it to Athens and then finally we did it in Lesbos um, and where he, had, he hadn't been before. But I felt that this wasn't really enough. <laughs> um, I don't want to make art out of other people's suffering. Um, and nor did Isa. And, you know, we wanted to maybe help the refugees. He could do some workshops. I could do, so I did do some workshops with teenage girls, Syrian teenage girls. I taught them a Greek song, um, um, but one is so helpless. And I'll, I'll tell you one story. And it, it suggests that really that it's the individual who helps even more than the structures. There was a German girl, German woman, had come and worked in a camp for a while. And there was a woman, a Syrian woman, who was mute. And she was upset. She was, she'd lost her, her, her husband. And the two children had gone. They were, she didn't know where they were. But she thought they might have got to Germany. She didn't know. And so she took a photograph of this woman on her phone. And she said, I will try and find them. She went back to Germany. She looked and she found them. There were two kids in different towns in hospitals, and they had both become mute from trauma. And she showed them the phone, the, the picture on her phone of their mother, and they started to speak. And then because, I mean, it was just the most amazing. And, and then because the policy of the UNHCR is to reckon, to get families back together, then the mother was able to go to Germany to join them because that was, that's the, that was the rule of the UNHCR, which is something that both Greece and my country shamefully are now questioning about pushing back the refugees. So, so the island, which had been a great island of hospitality, was now feeling threatened. And I feel that that is an illustration of what's to come. Of, of, you know, the, now with the, the war in, in the Ukraine, we are all, everybody's going to become more selfish to try and protect their own path. I think we have time for literally one question in the front row, or multiple questions. Okay, let's begin with Shadi. Oh. So it's always a treat to read both your work and hear you both because you're oozingly scholarly and uh, subtly lyrical always but because there's a problem of time i'm going to just uh, touch upon hunch prose because if i see the uh, trajectory and the arc from say zones over soul which is your first book down to hunch prose uh, there's a very very conscious sense of minimalism which you employed in this particular book including something very brave like leaving blank pages quite often um not just you know, rector, which gets left out if you have a sort of subtitle page, but you actually have, as you know, um, that, and also the fact that your line lengths are short and there's a lot of white space around. I've read the book a few times over and I know it's a very conscious device. I'd be very curious to know how you use this painterly element with the white space and the ink part to why and what was the impetus behind that? I think, Shadeep, thank you for the question. I think that comes more from music for me. Just the recognition over the years of um, how the silences in music or the pauses in a score are just as vital as whatever gets sounded, whatever appears as sound. So for me, this was all about really allowing for uh, whatever that is unsaid and resists language in silence to make space for that. And also in a way to treat the book as a set of invitations. So it's a way of including the reader and to, I'm not actually saying scribble notes, but the suggestion is that there is, there is it is, if you will, a sort of hospitable gesture to open the book up to readers in, in a, almost a literal way. And also because I'm working increasingly with fragments and bringing them together. So what, is, what swirls around the archipelago, archipelago of fragments is, is just as important as the words. 
Yes, that, that goes back to the poem you, we started with, the Ugur. Ugarit. And I discovered something wonderful. I met a cuneiform scholar just before I came here, and he told me something absolutely amazing. The Hittite for water is wa-o-ta. We could continue this. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm going to go back to Zones of Assault and to Shahid because I think poem one that opens Hunch Prose is Siddhi's Bombay is very much like Shahid's Shahid in Witness in Arabic and Beloved in Persian and also his Kashmir, 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 right? So what are the different Bombays for Siddhi and what are the different Bombays for you and who are you in conversation with in that narrative? It is. A, it's a huge question, but I think for me to to belong to Bombay means to belong to multiple languages and to be, in some sense, constituted by multiple languages and their experiences. So, if anything, it's a it's a kind of it's a kaleidoscopic belonging that this city invites you to be part of. So, there's something in the way the city was made and the way the city functions that really resists unitary, singular, narrow, bigoted identities. So that's it to me. So my question here was really, how does this enslaved person brought across as a child learn to belong, make things his own, and create a set of relationships out of adversity and vulnerability, and in some sense, learn to heal himself? So to me, th these, are the, these are the redemptive possibilities of Bombay or Mumbai. I think, I think in a way, it's a, it's a kaleidoscope of relationships. I mean, one of the questions I didn't ask him is who is the I in these poems? But of course you can't answer that. <laughs> but but it, it's this constant relating, noticing, giving, yielding, whirling around. Yeah. Thank you Sorry so much. Sorry about the fact that we don't have time, but both Ruth and Ranjit are going to be signing their books so they can take your questions over there also. Thank you so much, Ruth Padel and Ranjit Hoskote. We'd also like to thank Hot London Literary Retreat for their support. इस तारीख की रात को जब चंदू को बीवी का मैसेज आया तब उसे एहसास हुआ वो तो बहुत लेट हो चुका है पेरोल डिपार्टमेंट के संजय ने बोला था नया अकाउंट खोल लो वरना सैलरी नहीं मिलेगी तो बस बॉब बॉल डाउनलोड किया और झट से से